Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another episode in this weather map analysis series. In our last video, we started our journey upward into the atmosphere by looking at the uses of the 850 millibar map. And today we're going to continue that journey upward. We're going to discuss how to properly analyze the 700 millibar map and some of its main uses when making a forecast. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. The 700 millibar level generally exists at about 10,000 feet or about three kilometers above mean sea level. As with all upper air maps, the 700 millibar map has a standard set of conventions used when analyzing it by hand. Just like the 850 millibar map, geopotential height contours, or isohypses, are drawn in solid black every 30 meters or 3 decameters, with a base value of 3,000 meters or 300 decameters. So you draw in 2970 meters, 2940 meters, 3030 meters, 3060 meters, and so on. A 60 meter or 6 decameter interval is also acceptable. Isotherms, or lines of equal temperature, are drawn as dashed red lines every 5 degrees Celsius, although intervals of 2 or 4 degrees Celsius are acceptable as well. Everything else is at the forecaster's discretion. Whatever is helpful to the forecaster is just fine. For example, on the SPC 700 millibar map you see here, they draw in isodrosotherms, or lines of equal dew point, every 2 degrees Celsius. One of the main uses of the 700 millibar map, especially in severe weather forecasting, is identifying shortwave troughs. Short waves are small areas of perturbed flow embedded within a long wave trough. On this channel, we talk about them a lot as counterclockwise kinks in the geopotential height contours within the main flow. When analyzing a 700 millibar map, short wave trough axes are demarcated with dashed black lines. In this example, you can see the main trough, which is quite large, spanning almost the entire United States. Technically, this is still considered a short wave trough. Long wave troughs are those that you see on a global or hemispheric scale and major short waves typically span about 15 to 40 degrees in longitude. But for the purpose of severe weather forecasting, we can consider this our main trough, and the short waves are the smaller downward kinks in the height contours embedded within this larger trough. This is an interesting example where we see a ton of short waves. We have one in here, one here, a couple more notable ones here and here, and then a couple more subtle ones here and here. So we have at least five to six different short waves moving through the main trough. Here's another example. We have our main short wave trough here, and you can see a couple little kinks embedded within this main trough. One back here from Kansas into Colorado and New Mexico, a very subtle one from Missouri into Arkansas, and one up here across the Great Lakes states. Now, we don't always have to have a main trough in play for there to be short waves. We can have mostly zonal flow, which is a broad belt of generally west to east flow, with little ripples embedded within. In this example, we have mostly just a broad belt of southwesterly to westerly flow across the southern half of the country, with some subtle kinks moving through. We see one in particular here across Oklahoma and North Texas, as well as one here across the Midwest. Despite the lack of a main trough, these short waves can still help us out in terms of thunderstorm development, even in a mostly zonal flow regime. Now that we've learned how to identify short waves, why are they important? Well, short waves act as little engines that focus the necessary ingredients for the formation of precipitation and thunderstorms in a given environment. They provide a focused area of lift out ahead of them that can initiate thunderstorms. Especially in those more zonal flow regimes, a subtle short wave can be all it takes to initiate storms when all the other ingredients are present, moisture, instability, etc. Short waves, especially the larger ones, are also associated with colder air aloft, which can help destabilize the atmosphere. We'll revisit these concepts in the next episode of this series, but for now, know that the 700 millibar map is a good one to use to identify short waves. Another use of the 700 millibar map is to assess the strength and extent of the elevated mixed layer, or EML. As we talk about often on this channel, the EML is a layer of warm, dry, well-mixed air that emanates from the higher terrain out west and gets transported to the east atop the low-level moist layer. This acts as a cap or lid on the atmosphere, preventing surface air parcels from rising and creating convection until it's eroded. The EML tends to be centered roughly on the 700 millibar layer, which makes the 700 millibar map useful for estimating cap strength. We simply want to look at the values of the isotherms over a given region to see how warm they are, and some good thresholds to use to determine whether or not those temperatures are too warm to support convective development are those developed by John Davies. I'll put a link to his article with this chart in it in the description box below, but these are monthly 700 millibar temperature thresholds to determine areas that may be too capped, in other words, too warm for thunderstorm development. For example, in May, 700 millibar temperatures warmer than 9 to 11 degrees Celsius in a given area may be cause for concern as far as the cap being too strong. 
You can see that earlier on in the year, the threshold starts out quite low and increases through the spring, reaching a peak in the summer months before falling off again as we head into fall. For example, many chasers out there will remember May 20th, 2019, which featured a high risk across Oklahoma and northwest Texas. A potentially historic tornado outbreak was expected, but things didn't go as planned, and the culprit was a layer of slightly warmer mid-level air that crept in as the day progressed. You can see a broad expanse of warmer air emanating from the higher terrain of central and northern Mexico getting transported to the north into the southern plains via the southerly 700 millibar flow. Notice the 12 degrees Celsius isotherm making its way into southern Oklahoma by late afternoon, which is just above the Davies threshold for May. This was just enough to thwart open warm sector convection and negate a much more significant outbreak. Here's another example from June 17, 2014, which featured the infamous Coleridge, Nebraska EF3. This is the 700 millibar map from early afternoon that day, and you can see the 14 degrees Celsius isotherm stretching across much of eastern Nebraska into Kansas. This, once again, exceeds the Davies threshold for June, so capping would have been a slight concern on that day. Eventually, mid-level temperatures cooled slightly and storms did fire late in the day, with the Coleridge tornado occurring after 8 p.m., so the cap did hold on for quite some time before it finally eroded. Now, this 700 millibar temperature technique should only be used as a rough estimate of cap strength, as there are a number of potential drawbacks to this technique. First, these thresholds don't work well in higher elevation areas where terrain can help overcome slightly warmer air aloft, so places like eastern New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, western Nebraska, etc. Also, the cap is not solely located at 700 millibars, or in some cases, the 700 millibar level may not even capture a portion of the cap. The cap is a layer of the atmosphere that has vertical extent, so looking at the entire thermodynamic profile of the atmosphere, such as on a skew T diagram, can give us a better sense of how the cap might impact things. Third, you can also have forcing mechanisms, such as a cold front, that can force air through a capping inversion even if the 700 millibar temperatures exceed the threshold. In tandem with this, just because 700 millibar temperatures are cooler than the threshold does not mean that thunderstorms are a guarantee. For example, there can be a lack of a forcing mechanism, or you can have subsidence or sinking motion behind an early shortwave trough passage that can inhibit thunderstorm development despite a lack of cap. We can also use the 700 millibar map to assess mid-level moisture. Relative humidity, which you'll often see on model outputs, greater than 70%, or dew point depressions, which you'll often see in raw upper air data, less than 5 degrees Celsius generally indicate cloud cover and robust mid-level moisture. Of note, the 700 millibar map on the SPC mesoanalysis page shades relative humidity greater than or equal to 70% in green. On the flip side, dew point depressions greater than 20 degrees Celsius indicate dry air, and this can signify a couple of things. Number one, it can represent a conditionally unstable environment when you have this mid-level dry air atop adequate low-level moisture, which can be favorable for thunderstorm development. However, number two, it can also signify that dry air may be entrained into any robust convection, which can have negative impacts on thunderstorm intensity and longevity. I won't go too deep into this as it's beyond the scope of this video, but dry air in the mid-levels can be a double-edged sword. It can provide that loaded gun type thermodynamic profile, which can be favorable for intense convection, but it can also lead to updrafts ingesting this dry air, which can be detrimental to thunderstorm maintenance. We can also use the 700 millibar map for some of the same things that we analyzed on the 850 millibar map, including temperature advection. Again, we're looking for areas where isotherms cross the height contours at any angle. And we can also sometimes identify fronts aloft at the 700 millibar level, especially if they don't show up well in the low levels. If you'd like more information on these concepts, I'd recommend revisiting the previous episode in this series, part 4, on the 850 millibar map. Alright, that's going to do it for this episode on the 700 millibar map. In our next episode, we'll continue to ascend in the atmosphere by diving into the 500 millibar map, which is a critical level to analyze and forecasting all types of weather, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.